I find myself envying those who don't know some things are wrong. They appear to be having more fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, then you rue the day you ever laid eyes on me. <laughs> I know what you mean. Uh, but listen, your place in heaven, because of the knowledge you do have, and because of your struggle of trying to act in accord with that higher knowledge, that will gain you a much higher place in heaven than those people will ever have. Be assured of that. You know, you, you can have fun now, or you can be happy in heaven forever. It's like the Midas man said, you can pay me now, or you can pay me later. <laughs> in the last issue of the Catholic Herald, there were two opposing commentaries on how we should deal with panhandlers. Both had very valid points. Could you please enlighten me as to the church's position on this matter? Well, the church doesn't have a formal position on many, many matters. Now, this is a tough one. You know, in the last class, I, I told you about my experience in San Francisco. We see a lot of sad things. If you've ever been to Rome, when I went to Rome to be ordained, I saw there were more panhandlers. There are more panhandlers in Rome on the approach to the Vatican than any place else in the, in the world, I think. The, the gypsies go there, and the gypsy women will dress up in their black clothes and they have the poor little children, they, they get them and they put dirt on their faces and they look so pitiful and they train them how to look miserable. Padre, Padre. Believe me, most of it is an act. The gypsy godfather, one of them there, someone told me, owns one of the largest hotels in Rome. You know where the money came from? from the kid holding out his hand, Padre. Well, that's the truth. That goes on. Now, there are panhandlers, there are people who make a lot of money doing that for a living. I feel that it's stealing from the poor. Uh, we don't know who they are always, and you can't always assume that the person who comes up to you is a crook. A lot of them are crooks today. You know, plain English. But not all. Some people are down on their luck. Some people are, you know, in the street, homeless. And so, you know, I can't tell you who's who. Uh, I have to admit that, you know, if I were to know, uh, here's what I usually do. Rectories have a problem. I lived with a priest in Florida for a while, and he was the kindest man. And everybody knew it. And everybody took advantage of it. And every panhandler in that part of Florida knew to go there if you needed help. This man would give away his salary by the end of payday. And then he was broke. Well, I'm not going to criticize him for that. Now, it's true that that could be enabling a vice. You know, to do that is a vice, you know, the people that, that take the money. But he was very simple in his approach. I, I don't know. And if they come and ask me, what if they're poor? What if they really are poor and they're not a panhandler? What if it's Jesus come to ask me to be kind? And so I sympathize with that. And so, you know, I'm not going to give you the answer to that because I don't know it. But I do know that there, are, that there are a couple of different ways of looking at it. And there's, there is, like the note said, there's truth in both sides. But I personally believe that those who, you know, make a living at it and, and who could be working are stealing from the poor. Because I'll tell you what happens. After a while, you know, you wait, you, people don't like to be hustled. And once you find out you've been hustled, you're much less likely to give the next time to a really poor person. And so I think that those people can really be stealing from the poor. But I don't know always who's who. And so you have to use some discernment and, and, and try to figure that out. The Bible says, call no man father. Here's one of my favorite ones. How can I explain to non-Catholics why we, why we call priests father? Well, there's only one father, God, our father. There's only one priest. Jesus Christ is the only priest. 
we enter into the paternity of God our Father and make it present. And it is the paternity of the Father that's made present through the paternity of the priest, just as we enter into the priesthood of Jesus Christ and make it present, becoming, as it were, multiple subjects of his sacramental action. And so, yes, one father, yes, one priest, but we aren't setting up some kind of separate paternity, which is what that passage deals with. We are entering into and making present the paternity of God our Father. We are fathers. That if you carry that, then don't call dad father. Don't call your own father father. You know, if you want to use that logic, then don't call your natural father father. Is that what the church teaches? No. You can call your, your daddy father. Why? Because he has entered into the paternity of God our Father and manifested it. He's entered into God's creative power with his spouse, procreated, brought a child into being. Hence, he makes God's paternity present. The priest, a spiritual father likewise, makes God's paternity present. Father, what did you do about the poor drunk, down-and-out man that reminded you of Christ? <laughs> you know, you ask for questions, you get them. Well, I tried to help him. I tried to wake him up after a while, and I couldn't. He was so big. He was... I don't know, 250 pounds, at least, a big man. He was unconscious. I, I was in a strange place. I didn't know what to do. I tried to ask someone, how can you help someone like the police or something? They won't do anything. They, they won't, you know, there's so many of them. Now, I, I'm, I'm admitting to you something. I, I don't know whether to repent of it or... I didn't know what to do, honestly. I'm being honest with you. I wanted to help him. It broke my heart. Broke my heart. Uh, and, I, and I tried to do something tangible, physical, to, you know, you, you want to feed the hungry. You do want to take, take care of those who are sick or unable to take care of themselves. We want to, like Mother Teresa, what a wonderful example. I hope you're all praying for her. Uh, Mother is, as you know, very sick right now. Um, you know, she's been praying for us, you know. She's been offering her penances and sufferings for the success of this program from the beginning. I think I announced that once, but uh, we have a friend who knows her personally, and I, I'm going to do their annual retreat in December for the Missionaries of Charity, and Mother is supposed to be there for the retreat, and after that there'll be profession of vows, but now she's so sick, so I hope you're praying for her. But, you know, she's such a good example of how to take care of the poor, the poorest of the poor. She reaches out to them. She tries to take care of them. How can she do it? She sees Jesus in them. That was, that experience I had was an unusual, radical kind of experience that's never happened to me like that before. But it was a great blessing because it illustrated to me that no matter how miserable a person is, no matter how down and out, how dirty, how sick, how drunk, how sinful, how whatever, because they're human, made in God's image and likeness, there you will find Jesus if you have eyes of faith. I will pray for that man for the rest of my life. That man, his soul has no chance of escaping our prayers. I guarantee you that that man will be talked about all over the country. Every place I go, people will hear about that man. And I will ask all of you to pray for that man. I don't know his name, and you don't either, but we will pray for him. And anyone else, that we see. I go around collecting souls. I, I walk around, you know, and I see, and I, and I start with the worst ones. I have been praying for Madonna for a long time. 
Now I fully expect to find her in heaven. And, and you should pray for her too. Because anyone with a name like that certainly has a mother in heaven praying for her. The real Madonna is certainly praying for that wayward daughter of hers. And so, and no one is beyond God's grace. I don't care who it is and what they do. God wills not the death of any sinner. God wills to save everyone. I would love to catechize Madonna and put her in a convent someday, someplace. <laughs> Pray for that. Okay, another question. I'm glad you're feeling better. Thank you. We prayed for you. Thank you. There, okay, th this is concerning a person who has shared with another person that they're having an adulterous relationship. But this person doesn't want to hear uh, the truth, okay? The person in that adulterous relationship doesn't want to hear the, the truth, and I'm afraid to say anything about it. Am I committing a sin by not saying anything? Okay, I, that's a good question. I'm glad it was asked because I, you know, sometimes it's hard to say everything in one breath when you're giving a teaching. It is true that we have a, an obligation to speak the truth, to defend the truth, but there are times you have to have some discernment. Okay, things are received according to the disposition of the receiver. Okay, there are times when a friend of yours, a relative, can be live, doing, committing some terrible sin. Now you know it, they know it too, but you're uneasy, you can tell that they're not open. They're not receptive. If, if you would bring it up and say, why don't you stop that, you know, get away from that relationship, you know they'd blow up and, and distance you. you. You would drive them away. Now you pray about it. You pray about it. Perhaps you fast, you do penance, you ask the Lord for an answer, you invoke the Holy Spirit. I've had to do this many times. Now after all, I'm a priest. Most of you are not priests. I have a doctorate in theology. Most of you don't have a doctorate in theology. There are, very often there are times when I can't do any more than you can. And I pray about it, and, and you know, it, it, the Lord seems to say, ah, ah, back off, love the person, love them, pray for them, do penance for them, offer your, self, your sufferings for them, and they will then come in my time. Only God can change a heart. Be very vigilant, though, for signs that they're ready. And so some people are not ready to hear the gospel. And so you pray for them, you intercede for them, and then they will come to you. I have had this happen time and time again. I knew they weren't ready. I've had it happen with relatives, with friends, with acquaintances. People say, Father, please talk to my brother, my son, whatever. And I sense that they're not ready. Boy, if I give them any doctrine or moral teaching, they're going to rebel. They're going to just throw me right out, dismiss me. And so I just try to be as kind and as gentle and as loving towards them as I can. And then, boy, I go back and storm heaven. And that's what you do, too. And I'll tell you, then what will happen, they'll come to you or they'll go to someone else. God knows who to send his children to and they will be helped. Okay, so it's not a sin every time when, you know, don't feel that every single time you've got to storm in and say, you're committing adultery, stop that, you're going to hell. Oh, no, no. You, you can't do that every time. Sometimes, yes, you have to witness to the truth, yes, but have some discernment. You know, that, that has to do with that prudence. You know, that, that has to do with with a certain kind of wisdom, knowledge, understanding, and counsel, give to the Holy Spirit. What about war uh, to preserve a country's right to freedom? Is this violence, which under the illusion of fighting evil, only makes it worse? Well, war is a horrible evil. Yes, right. Very often wars are fought, are fought uh, too quickly without exhausting all other possibilities. I suggest if you want, we've, we've um, we're going to be covering it soon, uh, maybe next class, uh, the teaching on the Fifth Commandment, on the right to legitimate self-defense. Now, 
uh, is it ever just to fight a war? Yes. There is a right to legitimate self-defense. Uh, can, can you, well, World War II, okay? Hitler, Nazi Germany, an evil empire by any stretch of the imagination. The men, that, that, the men and women that went off to fight in World War II, uh, were they committing a sin? Was this some violence they entered in? Absolutely not. Usually they were heroic. The founder of my order, who was a very holy man, was a SEAL, the predecessor of today's Navy SEALs. He was a UDT, frogman, underwater demolition. He told me that the reason that he enlisted in the armed forces during World War II was out of a sense of loyalty to God, number one, who was a God of goodness and justice, and his country, number two. But he and many others believed, with all their heart, that they were fighting outright evil. And so, yes, there is a right to legitimate defense. War is a horror. We are to avoid it. We are to cultivate peace. But there are times that come in the life of a nation or an individual where there is a right to legitimate self-defense, not only a right, but at times an obligation. If you read further in the teaching on the Fifth Commandment, you will find that some people, like fathers of families or leaders of nations, not only have a right, but an obligation to defend those that are, that are in their care. Can an Episcopal priest marry? If so, could he at a later date become a Catholic priest, even if he has had children and remains married? If so, what is the Church's reasoning? Well, interesting that you ask that. One of the great blessings I've been given lately is to have from three completely unrelated directions, three Episcopal priests get in touch with me. One or two of them was from different places in the country through Mother Teresa. They had contacted her and asked her about it. And the sisters in San Francisco, the Missionaries of Charity, referred them to me. So I'm dealing with this right now. Three different Episcopal priests. I, I had a letter from one this week. Of, I had written to him already. He had asked me some hard questions, and I'd given him some hard answers. Wasn't giving him any easy way out, and boy, I got a letter back, and he was so thankful. I was so edified by the letter. Can an Episcopal priest marry? Yes. Yes, many of them, if not most, are married. If so, could he at a later date become a Catholic priest? Well, it depends. Right now, my order is helping to facilitate the entrance into the Catholic Church of 2,500 Anglican priests in England through Cardinal Basil Hume. But, but, there are requirements. Obviously, the man, the Episcopal priest, would have to believe what we believe. This beautiful letter I had this week from this man, oh, I, you know, I, I, maybe I, I, if I had it, I'd read it to you. He said, to the effect, Dear Father, I was so happy to receive your letter, and even happier when I found out that you're loyal to our Holy Father, Pope John Paul II. For me, that's the acid test, he said. This is, an Angl this is an Episcopal priest saying this. And I had told him about a certain school of theology that isn't so particularly trustworthy and a lot of dissonance. Oh, I'm well aware, he said, and I'm, you know, working with that. And he said many beautiful things. Now, <clears throat> can an Episcopal priest in principle be brought into the Catholic Church? Yes, of course, it's been done, sometimes with their entire parish. All right? So what would they do? The, he would, the, the man would study. Now, they already know a lot of theology, but they would have to study a, an amount of Catholic theology to make sure they know what we believe. And then they would have to be ordained in the Catholic Church. Now, the question is, well, well could they do that even though they're married and have children? Yes. Going back to the teaching on holy orders, remember that 
the fact that a man has a wife and is married doesn't immediately eliminate him from the possibility of ordination. A, a priest can never marry. But a married man, as witnessed the Eastern Catholic rites, they, they, uh, they can take a wife and then be ordained. All right, so, so the man's already married. He can be ordained and then function as a Catholic priest. That's not like women's ordination, which is a theological impossibility. This is a theological possibility. So uh, there is a, a thing called the Anglican usage rite. It's a, a, um, a litur liturgy, a rite, that's very close to the Anglican rite that they use in the Anglican church. There are so many Anglican priests and Episcopal priests desirous of entering the Catholic church that we have to respond to this. We, it's, it's the work of the Holy Spirit. And so the church opens her arms as a good mother. Many of these men uh, are, are men of faith. They're good men. And so we want, to, we want to be able to do that. So it's possible for a married man to be ordained. Even some of the apostles probably were married men when they were ordained. But we don't do that in the current discipline of the Roman rite, the Latin rite, because we, fee we know the great value of celibacy in the priesthood. But we recognize that in the Eastern rites, that has been their tradition, and we, we honor it. And taking that logic, we apply it to the case of the Anglican or Episcopal priest. Okay. How can it be right not to allow a child the right to be brought into this world being wanted or to be conceived by the free will of both parents. I am questioning the right to an abortion from incest or rape. How can we make something right that was wrong? This should, should be a choice because there will also be mental suffering in both the child when he comes to realize how he came into this world and the parent living with the violation of their human rights that occurred. I do not believe in abortion except for these circumstances. Should we not make allowances when the circumstances call from, for compassion? I submit to you that it is not compassion to murder someone who came to be through unfortunate circumstances. What is the higher right and the higher good? There, this is very dangerous thinking, and I know you asked the question because you're a good person and you're interested in, in doing what's right and what's compassionate and what's good. The highest thing there is is existence. The most preeminent right or good is existence. Let's say we don't bring that, that child into the world. That child Sure, the deck may be stacked against that child, but I want to tell you something. The deck is stacked against a lot of us. A lot of us come into this world with, with all kinds of problems. We have to give the child a chance to live. That child could grow up to be a saint. Don't buy that specious reasoning that of necessity that child is going to turn out no good. Unwanted. A lot of people start out unwanted and then become great persons in this world. Once there was a couple, and they had several children, and several of those children were born deformed, deaf, blind, with all kinds of problems, mental illness. And finally, the doctor, the, the woman was pregnant again, and the doctor said, look, you've, been, you've just had too much trouble. Now, you've got to abort that baby. Stop this. You're hurting society. And so they were Catholic, and they prayed about it, and they thought about it, and they said, no, we can't do it. We'll have the child. The child was born deaf. The child today is known as Beethoven. And some would argue that a great deal of good came to humanity through the life of, of Beethoven. Someone told me when we were at this 
retreat in Oregon last week. We were talking, and one of the young women said uh, her mother conceived and was told there would be an ectopic pregnancy and that it was a danger to her life and probably that the mother would die. And so the doctor strongly encouraged a termination of that pregnancy because surely we need to preserve your life. And they prayed about it and they talked about it and they said, no, we cannot do that. The child has been conceived, the child exists, and so if I have to die trying to bring that child into the light of day, then so be it. And of course, that child was the one telling us the story. And so it is true that rape and incest are horrible things. But do we add murder on top of those evils? What manner of logic is that? And so a human being is a human being, and that dignity and that grace and that gift transcends any other consideration. The good of being is a good which transcends everything else. Imagine, let me show you the logic here. <clears throat> Imagine someone would be conceived and born, and that person was destined to live a horrible life, rejected, a mo mother, a prostitute, father, a drug addict, come into the world like that, abused from when they were little. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, let's say they were born into a family of Satanists. And from the beginning, those Satanists abused that child. And the father and the brothers of that little child, when she became a teenager, got her pregnant, and they used those babies in a black mass. And that person went from bad to worse and suffered for a very long time and carried the scars of it. If you had known all that would, ha was, would happen and you were the parent, would you say, no, let it not be? If you could have said in the beginning to God, no, let that child not come to be, would you say that? Many people would say, yes, I would prevent that. Bad choice. The person exists. And let me tell you, I know that person I described. And that person once went to confession to me. And that person once got baptized in the basement of a church by me. And that person followed me all around the country listening to us preach. And that person is a pillar of, a church, of the church and a good mother to her children and a good wife to her husband. Would it have been better that she never be born? Well, some might think so for about 30 years, but there's all the rest of her life left to become a saint. And so we need to be careful with how we think. Do we try to be a saint, or are we already a saint? <clears throat> I have heard that before, and even St. Paul talks about the saints. You know, he addresses the people of God as the saints. And in a manner of speaking, I can call you saints. I don't usually do that because I don't want you to get too comfortable. <laughs> but yes, you're in a state of grace. You're friends of God. You're members of his church, his family. And so in a manner of speaking, you know, we're members of the body of Christ. We're part of the communion of saints, all those in a state of grace here, all those in purgatory, all those in heaven, communion of saints. But we're on the way. We haven't arrived yet. And so I don't use the term very much because, you know, I, I'm in a pretty good place today, I think, but I don't know where I'm going to be tomorrow or next year, and I know very well that I'm not yet in heaven, even though I enjoy your company. <laughs> but I think we have something else to look forward to. When I get to heaven, then I think I can rightly be called a saint because the saints are those blessed who are in heaven. And so I think after we've arrived, we can feel more comfortable with the terms. What do you say to college-level teachers who are teaching students that man came from apes? Well, you will tell the following story to them that my friend, Father Peter Wood from Florida, told. When he was a newly ordained priest, he was sent to a new parish in the town of Apalachicola. Florida. And he found out that there was a county fair. 
in Apalachicola that weekend. And so he didn't really know anybody, but so he went to the county fair, and there was a country and western band just tuning up, and there was going to be a concert. So Father Peter said he went over and bought a hot dog, and he got ready to uh, listen to this concert. And so the good old boys tuned up, and one of them started a song, and it began like this. I ain't no kin to a monkey. Don't you dare call me kin to a monkey. No, I ain't no kin to a monkey. And so what you do is you learn that song, and you sing that to the teacher. <laughs> and if they are in sin, they will have done penance listening to you. My name is Cece, seven years old, Cecilia. You are so good, I like you. Well, I like you too. I'm going to do a rare thing. I'm going to let one of you ask one more question. Yes. The what? Promise keepers? Yes. I, I'm. I'm not real, from, I'm somewhat familiar with it, promise keepers. I think the concept of it, uh, once again, I don't know a great deal about it, but what I know about it seems to be uh, very good. These, the promise keepers are men. Men, Christian men, come together and they have kind of conferences and it's an attempt to try to get men, family men, mostly fathers, to live up to the responsibilities as Christian spouses and fathers more. Uh, it's had great success as far as I know. They fill up football stadiums and, and they really have a, a, a tremendous time of it. Uh, I was once asked uh, to speak at one in Denver and because they haven't had a great Catholic presence, uh, at least then, uh, I think it's a good idea. I'll tell you, there are a lot of dads today, more than moms, in our society uh, who, don't, who don't live up to their responsibility as fathers and husbands. And when that happens, society unravels. And that's what's behind a lot of our problems in society. Very often, well, all the way across the board, but there's a... Uh, I don't know his name, but he's a, he's a Baptist preacher, African-American man. He's a wonderful preacher. Uh, I, I listened to him on tape when I was in Wyoming once, giving a retreat. And, and this man was just tremendous. And he, he talked about men living up to their vocation as father, not abdicating it. And he, talk about, he talked about men not becoming womanized, sissified creatures. Be a man. Be a man. And live up to your responsibility as a man. Be a real husband to your wife and a real father to your children. And he talked about the Fido mentality. And he talked about young men who go around acting like dogs. And you know, that, that whenever they see a female, that they go in heat. And he said, don't have the Fido mentality. Your dignity is beyond that. And he talked in this kind of way, very simple, straightforward. He was really humorous. But I'll tell you something. If men would live up to their responsibility, we wouldn't have a great deal of trouble with the women. For some reason, women in general, not always, but in general, uh, women have a sense for what's good. Women aren't usually the ones who cause most of the problems. Now, I know there are exceptions, but usually it's the men. You know, the men are running off here, and the men aren't living up to their responsibilities. So Promise Keepers is trying to deal with that. They're trying to address that. They're trying to get men to see that it's great to be a dad. It's a wonderful blessing to be a Christian father and a Christian husband. That's a great vocation. I talked about that all week in Oregon last week to families. I talked about 
the two most noble, beautiful vocations, that of being a mom and a dad. There was one, I remember, I, I'm not going to look through all these, but there was one that was, I picked out because I thought it was very good. It said, we know that when we confess our sins, and we have contrition, we know God forgives us. But what about if you, if you keep committing those sins over and over again, indicating to you that maybe you don't really have a firm purpose of amendment? All right. It's a very good question and a very important question. Very often, people get into a pattern of sin, and they do commit the same sins over and over and over again. It's like a downward spiral, a death spiral, and they can't seem to break out of it. And, and they hate the sin that they're committing. Oh, on one end, you say, well, they love the sin. Well, they're doing it. But they hate it in a way. They wish they weren't. Jesus said, the man who sins becomes a slave to sin. People get caught in terrible mortal sins, and they can actually hate them. I've had many people tell me, Father, I commit this, this mortal sin um, habitually, and I hate it. Even when I'm doing it, I'm hating it and crying inside and telling God I'm sorry, and oh, I, I sympathize with that. I sympathize very greatly with that, and here's the way you have to approach that. You have to do the best you can. Yes, you have to repent. Yes, as best you can, you have a firm purpose of amendment. But what you've got to do is never give up. Never become despondent. Never allow the devil to destroy you through that darkness which says, you belong to me. You'll never change. You're a sinner. Don't ever buy into that. You keep on fighting. Let me tell you something that gives me great consolation. I'm one of the biggest sinners that you'll ever meet. And, and my life has been a terrible testimony to serious sin. Most of my adult life, the last 12 years, God's blessed me, but I'm still a sinner. But for many years, I lived in terrible sin. You know, one day recently, I was reading, it was a, at one of the readings, I think on Sunday, or at least one of the mass readings recently, where Jesus has asked, Lord, if my neighbor offends me, my brother offends me, how many times must I forgive him? Seven? Remember? And our Lord says, I, not, not seven, I tell you 70 times seven. Now that indicates an, an indefinite in, number, an infinite number. Seven is the number of perfection. That's God's number. And God is saying an infinite number of times. Now look, who, look, look who's giving us counsel here. It's Jesus, eternal truth, God and Son of God. What's Jesus saying? You've got to forgive him an indefinite number of times. Oh, thank you, Lord. I know you will practice what you preach. <laughs> that gives me great consolation. It's got to be true. If we are to forgive our neighbors an infinite number of times, so long as that neighbor comes and forgive me, I'm sorry. Of course, that's the heart of God. And so you go to God if it's the millionth time you've committed that sin, but you are sorry for that sin. You're almost desperate. You're trying to get out of it. You'll hate it, but you just can't seem to break. You go to God, and you go with confidence, and know very well that the Lord who said an infinite number does that himself. No matter how many times you go to him, he will never get tired of seeing you show up on his doorstep and say, Lord, I am sorry. Because when you say that, it's a, it's a demonstration of trust in the divine mercy. And so don't use it, of course, as an excuse to keep sinning, but by all means, let it, let it give you consolation and work hard and keep praying. And pray a lot that God breaks you free. Next month is my mother's birthday, and we plan to take her to a restaurant for dinner on Sunday, which is her birthday. Are we leading others into sin by going to a restaurant on Sunday? Well, I don't think so. Uh, I, you know, it's a... You could look at it from both sides. You know, this is one of those questions. It's true that we are not supposed to make it harder for people to rest on Sunday, but by the same token, uh, most of those people in the restaurant would be there probably anyway. Now, I, I, there are two sides. You could say, yeah, but Father, you know, if you show up, you know, if nobody showed up, they couldn't work on Sunday, and maybe they'd, you know, worship God. On Sunday, well, yes, yes, I, I see that, that side of it. I don't, I'm giving you an opinion. I'm not giving you here 
uh, there's not a written doctrine on every little thing in the church. I'm giving you an opinion. I, I don't think it's a sin. I think if you take mom, you know, you're doing something for the family, right? It says that right in the catechism. Sunday, you should, it should be a family day, yes. Put God first, but bring God into the context of your family. I personally don't believe that that would be a sin. It's true, we shouldn't make it into a day of commerce. We shouldn't make Sunday a habitual day of commerce and, and constant shopping and, and so forth. But to take mom to dinner on her birthday, I, I, don't, I don't think, in a restaurant, I don't think that that would be a, a sin. How or why are some people demon-possessed? Well, possession is highly unusual, okay? I, I know I alluded to that in, I guess, the last uh, class. But possession is a highly unusual thing. Very rarely occurs. Now, there is something called obsession, which is a lesser degree where the demonic will be involved in the life of a person. How does that happen? Well, usually sin is involved, usually. But sometimes it can happen uh, through various occult practices, dedication, uh, selling of... I've even heard of children that were sold to the devil. I could tell you hair-raising stories uh, of people that I've run into that through no fault of their own when they were children, they were born into families that practice Satanism and so forth. Well, the one thing I can tell you is this. Don't worry about it, because so long as you are in Christ, the devil can't mess with you. Oh, yeah, he'll, certainly he'll take his shots. But there's a great analogy. I like it very much. If there is a very vicious dog, imagine a 300-pound pit bull, and he's chained up on a six-foot chain. Now, this is the advice I'm giving you about the devil. Stay more than six feet away from him, <laughs> and he will not cause you a great deal of harm. Right? A dog on a six-foot chain doesn't do much harm eight feet from there. So just stay out of reach. How do you do that? Don't give yourself to the devil through sin. Don't give him a chance to take a shot at you. It's through sin that we begin to get in trouble. Oh, it doesn't happen all at once, a little bit at a time. But that's, that's the, the main piece of advice. Remain in a state of grace. In this day and age, you're taking a very serious chance to not be in a state of grace for a prolonged period of time. Why? Because you're open season. That's why. You're open season. You're not protected. You don't want to be unprotected in a violent, sick world. Okay, can you, can you elaborate on praying in tongues? Second request. Well, yeah, I, I, I can to a certain extent. I can tell you from my own experience. Now, this, this is one of the things that is not, once again, as I said, not everything uh, has a defined doctrine. The church does not rule on every... We sometimes wish that it would. We wish there'd be a book where there was a dogma that covered every situation in life, but we know there's, that's not true. My own experience, okay? You don't have to agree with me. I have researched it. I have had experience with it. I have heard both sides of the argument. Sometimes in the end, you have to apply the basic spiritual axiom that you know the tree by the fruits. On the second or third anniversary of my conversion, I was in novitiate. My spiritual director and the novice master were, had both been around the charismatic renewal, and I learned things about it. Now, we know that Scripture references a gift called tongues, praying in tongues. We know St. Paul exhorted the people to not be too concerned about praying in tongues. It's a lesser gift unless the, the gift of interpretation of tongues were operative in the assembly. It seems that there is such a thing as tongues. Now, it's not just being able to speak in a language that everybody understands. That's one kind of tongues that shows up in... In Scripture, there's a thing called glossolalia. That's prayer in a, a tongue or a voice that is not 
uh, normally a language that you would know, that you have learned cognitively. A person in a state of grace, all right? A person who is trying to serve God, a person who has been perhaps prayed over by someone who has authority, a priest perhaps, maybe a prayer group in union with him. Now, I'm going to give you my experience. You don't have to agree with me on that. I'm not teaching you uh, some dogma here, and I hesitate even to mention it. But the person asked the question twice, and they have a right, you know, to an attempt at least. My personal experience, the fruits that I've seen, is that, yes, there is such a thing as praying in tongues. Do not immediately jump to a conclusion and think it is of the devil. When I first came in contact with it, that's exactly what I thought. I thought, man, this is bad news. Let me out of here. <laughs> I, this is, get me out. I, and I was mad. I wanted, I didn't want to hear about that. I didn't want to see that. This is some kind of, this isn't Roman Catholicism. I remember thinking that. Through experience, I prayed. Now, my spiritual director was a very, very holy man, the novice master, a wonderfully holy man. I trusted them. I knew they weren't crazy. I knew they weren't evil. And they tried to explain it to me, and they said, you have to experience it. And I, well, I'm not interested in experiencing that. And so it went on. Well, I'll tell you, it was on the, I believe, the third anniversary of my reconversion to the faith. A very good priest, three of them, prayed over me, and I, nothing happened. And I went for a walk. And, you know, they had said, well, if you will just yield to that gift. It's a gift that almost anybody can receive under the right circumstances. It's not something you will into having. It's something you yield to. And so I said, well, okay, I don't know what that means. But I just went out and I prayed the rosary. Now, the rosary has always been my main form of personal prayer. It's vocal prayer. It's meditative prayer. And it leads you into contemplative prayer. It's the prayer of the gospel. Mysteries, 13 of them are right out of the gospel. So the rosary is wonderful prayer. It's been my main form of prayer back then, now, probably always will be. I was praying the rosary. And all of a sudden, out tumbles, you know how a, a brook or a, uh, a spring bubbles up from the ground? Well, this came out. Did I have control over it? Yes. I mean, was it out of control? No. No, I could turn it on and shut it off. It was spontaneous. It was real, and I began to say, boy, I'm goofy. I've been listening to these characters a little too long. And I, I said, Lord, you know, I don't want anything to do with this. Nothing to do with this. If this isn't of you, get me out of here fast. Within a minute, a woman shows up. I was on a boat dock, and this woman is walking, and after a while I can see she was sobbing and crying. And this prayer is coming, this prayer in tongues. And I have had for a long time at times the infused gift of contemplation. And it can draw you into a deep peace, and, and that was happening. A tremendously deep peace was coming out of this, this prayer in tongues. And finally this woman was sobbing uncontrollably, and I I, I went over to her and I, I said, well, uh, what's wrong? Can I help you? And she said, my life is a nightmare. It's a horror. I have no hope. I, I, I'm going to kill myself. I'm suicidal. And I began to talk with her. And I began to tell her things about herself. God gave me words that didn't seem to be my own. Maybe they were his. I don't know. The woman changed. In an hour, she was smiling. She had hope. She came to Mass every day. Every day, every day. That was the first thing that I ever saw happen. I said, well, maybe that was a coincidence. After all, she could have just walked out there. No, no big deal. The next Sunday, I was, after Mass, making my Thanksgiving, walking down that same trail through the woods down to the boat dock. And out of the, another trail came a young woman. I was praying the rosary again. And she said, well, let's pray together. And so we prayed the rosary together. And we continued on, the rosary stopped, and then we just were silent. 
and I began to pray silently in tongues. And then I said to her, how long have you felt you've had a Carmelite vocation? And she looked at me and she said, well, how did you know that? And I said, well, I don't know. And I said, and, and certainly you belong at Carmel in a certain place in New Jersey. And she said, how did you know I have an appointment there on Wednesday? And now, I don't make a big deal out of these things. Maybe you could say, another coincidence, Father. Okay, I wouldn't argue with you. I, I don't push the point. I'm not pushing it. I had several things like that. And I concluded, and I don't push it, and I don't, you know, tell you you have to do that or you've got to pray in tongues. Nope. But my personal experience has been very positive. I have had many, many encounters with the forces of evil, many, many times. Spontaneously, I would begin to pray in what's called rebuking tongues. I have seen the power of God work through this. I have seen them run. You ever see a demon set on fire by the word of God? I'll tell you, it's something. I'm telling you there's power in it. You've, you've touched on something. I never talk about this. I never talk about it, and maybe I should. I stick to the doctrine of the faith. You know that. I try to teach faith and morals right out of the book. I try to go right by it. But, you know, every once in a while, somebody will ask a question, it pushes a button, and you, you know me. You know, I don't usually hold back. I've got to tell you the truth. This one you don't have to accept if you don't want to. You don't have to believe me. But I can tell you I've had experience with it. I've had long experience with it. I've had hard experience with it. I have seen the power for good, the power to rout evil. And so I tell you, yes, there is such a thing. It is a gift which is very humble. It is a gift where you yield to the power of God. We are very rational creatures, and we should be, but that doesn't mean we want to become rationalists. That is not a good thing. You know, we become the kind of people, unless I can see it, I don't want to accept it. Unless I can think everything out perfectly, I don't want to pray it. Unless I'm in charge, I won't do it. Well, I say to the Holy Spirit, you are the Spirit of God. You are the breath of God, the Ruach HaKodesh, God's holy breath, the life of God, and you can breathe through me. I am merely an instrument of God, and if you, divine Spirit, breath of God, want to go through me as a poor instrument, then do it. And very, very often, great things have happened. What is it? It's God using the instrumentality of our poor little finite human nature to make be beautiful music for God. The Holy Spirit knows how to discern the deep things of God. We know not how to pray. The Holy Spirit prays through us with groanings and, and utterances that are beyond human reason. God knows how to pray to God. And it's really quite a humble thing to accept that and to allow the Holy Spirit to work through you, lifting up praise, adoration, thanksgiving, and impetration to God. So what do I think personally? I've been through it. I know something about it. Yes, tongues is an authentic gift in the church, but, you know, it's not the kind of thing that you can quantify, you can't put it under a microscope, you can't measure it, but and it's not something you're going to find in a number in the catechism. But there are many things that aren't laid out in detail there. You don't have to accept it. I'm not teaching this as something you must accept. I'm just trying to respond in a, in a, as best I can to an honest question with an honest answer. Okay. A je well, we don't, we're all, we don't want to pick on the Jesuits. A, a certain priest, a certain kind of priest. <laughs> Cat's out of the bag, too late. All right, a Jesuit priest preached that it was sufficient to love our neighbor as ourselves. We did not need to love God. Comments, please, you bet. Here they come. To say that all we have to do is love our neighbor and we don't have to love God betrays an underlying total ignorance of spiritual reality. 
my first question would be, how on earth do you think you're going to love your neighbor without the power you receive from loving God? Impossible. How are you going to do something which is a supernatural thing, loving your neighbor as yourself? And it's, called, it's a supernatural love, not just a mere natural love. That's not what we're called to do. How are you going to do that unless you're, once again, plugged in to the power source? How does that happen? That's your relationship with God. That's the vertical dimension, our relationship with God. After that's established and we're plugged in, we're united, then the power flows. Then we are capacitated, enabled to love our neighbor. How come? Because we have the power to love our neighbor. Why? Because the one who is love itself has given himself to us. We have reciprocated. Love is repaid by love alone. That commerce of love results in an ability to love our neighbor. And so there's no such thing as loving your neighbor without first loving God. That's an, an, an illusion, a fantasy, and, and a total lack of understanding of spiritual things. I don't understand doing penances. Well, there was a great document by Pope Paul VI entitled Penitimony. That basically is the church's contemporary document on penance. The primary form of penance in the church is accepting joyfully the trials and tribulations which our state in life bring to us. That's, you know, moms, you know, hey, being a mom and a wife, accepting with joy the difficulties that your state in life entails. Dads, accepting, you know, the difficulty, going to work every day, supporting the family, you know, the, the, um, uh, the anxieties of daily life, bringing up your family in a tough world. By accepting joyfully the trials, tribulations, even the sufferings which your state in life bring, that's the primary form of penance. How do we do that? Quite simply, it's an act of the will. That's all. The will is very powerful. What happens? Well, I have to do that, right? I, I'm a priest. Maybe, maybe on a given day, I don't feel well. Maybe I'm, I'm, I'm physically not feeling well. Well, you know, those things can be penances too. Uh, those sufferings, those sacrifices, we offer, that, that's a form of penance too. Uh, well, on a given day, let's say um, yesterday, Friday, I, I would fast a little bit. Say, well, I want to offer this to the Lord. Uh, I want to do that little penance uh, and apply it to some, like today's program, to open somebody's heart or mind. Well, that's a form of penance. That's an example of doing that. Um, you might not like cleaning toilets very much. It may not be your favorite thing to do at home. but. You merrily go about your job, toilet brush in hand, saying, good Lord, I hate this job, but I joyfully accept it, and I offer it up to you as a penance. It's not meaningless. That's not use useless. St. Teresa used to say, God moves about the pots and pans, and he really does. You know, in, in those little things, those annoying things, putting up with me can be a great penance for some of you. Oh, it can. It really can. But you say, well, all right. He means well, at least. And so let me put up with him. I only have three more days to go. I can probably stand that. But, well, I'm going to offer it up as a penance anyway, because it's not so easy. Wonderful. It might not be pleasant sometimes, you know. Sometimes to put up with your husband can be difficult. Okay. Offer those difficult times up. And there's power in it. Okay, could you please repeat what makes law authentic, then define what competent authority is? Okay, it's a good question. Authentic law is law which takes its origin from the divine law. Now remember that God is truth. God is the good. Anything that's true and good subsists in God, takes its origin from God. An example of something that isn't really authentic law, Wade versus Roe. 
and the law legalizing abortion. Is it law? Is it authentic law? No. No. Is that a real law? No, it isn't. Why? Because it doesn't have its origin in divine law. It is not part of the, ma the natural law, which manifests divine law. And so it's not authentic law. It's not in accord with reason. Let's face it. As I've said many times to people, and I have great sympathy for women who are suffering, they're scared, they're all kinds of reasons why they're afraid, maybe, to have the child. I sympathize with that. But I say, what do you think that is? Remember, law has to be in accord with right reason. What is that? And what are you doing to that? This thing now about partial birth abortion, an unbelievable, heinous abomination of a crime, that could be legal. That's when you know a country has totally lost its moral mind, when something like that is legal. That's the law of the land. Listen, don't be surprised at anything from now on. From now on, to murder the elderly or someone who doesn't have blonde hair or blue eyes, oh, that's nothing. Because let me tell you something. If you can do partial birth abortions, you can do anything. You can repeat Dachau. You can repeat Auschwitz. You can repeat all the horrors and abominations of Nazi Germany, because if you can take a babe extracted from the mother's womb, and you know the rest of it, you can do anything. And when a country has elevated that outrage to the status of law, that country for sure has gone insane, has lost its moral sense, no longer knows what is good, what is evil, no longer knows the truth from a lie, and look out when that kind of thing becomes the law of the land. And so that's an example of something that's not real law. That's why people who don't obey that law or resist that law aren't breaking the law, because that's not authentic law. We are supposed to love our enemies for the love of God, but we don't have to like them. Where do you draw the line? Well, remember, love is an act of the will, a decision, right? Someone could be driving me crazy, maybe. Now, I have to love them. Someone could have performed a partial birth abortion or had one. Must I love them? Of course. I must love them. I must love them. I might not like very much what they did. I hate it. Yes. I don't have to maybe like their personality, but I have to decide to love them. An act of the will. What will I do if I love them? I will pray for them. I will serve them. I will do everything I can to help to show them Jesus Christ, to bring them to conversion. And so, yes, there are times when we might not like certain persons, but we have to love them. The cardinals and bishops of the U.S. were united in urging Congress to override the presidential veto of the partial birth abortion ban act. Now that the vote is over and many Catholic senators, and I, yes, I just saw the list, many Catholic senators and House members did not vote in accordance with the teaching of the church. Catholic senators did not vote in accordance with that. What happens to those Catholic legislators? Well, let me tell you what I think should happen <laughs> to those Catholic legislators. I wish to start there. And let me tell you what is an abomination if it doesn't happen. And let me tell you something that will weigh on the conscience, the heart of every bishop when he goes before God at the end of his life. If he doesn't do what God has probably already done, he's got to say, you're doing that. Don't claim the name of Catholic because you're not. They must be excommunicated.
It is absolutely impossible. It is inconceivable. It is unjust. It is an outrage that any senator, that any member of the House who's Catholic or Christian can vote not to ban partial birth abortion. In other words, that's saying, let's do it, okay, fine. They must be excommunicated publicly. The scandal is public. The remedy must be public. And there's no other way. And the bishops have got to do that. The bishops have got to do that, not acting out of respect for man, but for God. And this is something that we may see. When we do see it, we may see some serious recriminations from the point of view of, of government. Well, you know, let it come. From the beginning, it was never easy to be Christian. It was never easy to follow Christ. It was never easy to spread out your arms and climb on a cross. But we know that the story doesn't end there. It goes towards resurrection.